few minutes late starting, so I apologize for that. Uh, welcome to Moving Forms, Moving Bodies, a title of an event which I hope will provoke reaction and discussion. I have to say that we're not um, purporting to be experts in any one or right across the board sphere. It's that we're all people here that feel that this subject has got a lot of um, interaction and interrelation and it needs to be continued. There are some things that a lot of you I hope will disagree wildly about, others you might agree with. Uh, the Friday night lectures uh, often come under the category artist talks. This series on dark and dance and architecture is included. One important tradition that the AA must continue is its engagement with other creative disciplines, both in practice and in theory. Apart from my own interest and involvement with dance, I have to mention Ken Bartlett, who I hope is here, but I can't see him, which was something to do with, uh, a year ago. He set up a think tank for dance and architecture. Uh, there were a lot of very exciting people there. Uh, we were all very excited to get something happening because, to my knowledge, there hasn't been much yet, although a lot of people are talking about this crossover. Well, it was supposed to happen now. This is happening now instead. Um, so I feel I've done my bit, and I hope my bit continues. What he's got in... We don't know yet. Anyway, many people have enabled this forum to happen, one um, being students who requested Momentary Fusion to come, who were the first in the series of the talks, which started three weeks ago. Their topic, anti-gravity, I hope again will come up tonight, perhaps to do with the groundless discussion within architecture. Moving architecture, Ed Frith and Caroline Salem, I only met recently, but as the title of their um, project, Moving Arch Architecture, says is that they meet the two grounds that we are to open our discussion on tonight. Um, for those that haven't um, read something that I wrote to do with the forum, I'll read it out now. From the classical representations of the relationship of the human body to architecture, through the phenomenological experience of the interior and exterior body space to the debate on dynamics and the formless. Is there a new understanding of the body-space interaction? So with that, I'm going to move over to you, Ed. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Julia. Is that working, John? It's not as good as this one. Can you use that one? I want to thank Julia particularly for really raising this issue because for me there are many opportunities to really engage in a debate and I hope that you'll all take advantage of the, um, as this is a forum and a chance to discuss the issues that come up. Um, I sort of say it doesn't happen, the discussion doesn't happen very often. There is a lot of moving architecture around at the moment and that's one of the most fascinating aspects of it. And I feel a little bit of a fraud because um, I don't really feel like a necessarily a part of that moving architecture um, image or scene that goes on. For me, it's been more about a collaboration with a choreographer and some of the more, in a way, detailed aspects that have come out from that. Um, moving architecture has sort of been investigating different issues for about um, 10 years or so. In fact, I think for me the connection was um, talking to Peter Buchanan ten years ago and asking wh wh where where are the connections between the two and he, t he re referred me to the Halpens in San Francisco and said he th thought that was about the only book on it um, and yet in the last five or six years things have moved very very quickly. Now in discussion when we were um, arranging this thinking about the forum five issues tended to sort of dominate the discussions. Time, technology, language, notation, and play. In terms of time, there's a sort of historic time where we can wander back to the Bauhaus and Oscar Schlemmer and say, isn't it, uh, wasn't all this happening then? And sort of similar issues happening. Um, or we could be very close to Merce Cunningham examining his choreographic techniques and just thinking very carefully about time. 
when you move into technology, this for me it, it's going to be when some of the discussion may arrive around the technique of the da of choreographer and dancer. Yet, um, in fact, I was having a discussion today with Caroline about the fact that the for her that isn't techno that isn't the technology. The technology is probably in other realms of. Um, that uh, someone like Wayne McGregor last week would have would have sort of <coughs> introduced. So to notation, and many of you will know of the Laban notation, where in in dance there's a very st strong idea of how to measure and record work. That architects sort of say, this is a really interesting thing. Let's let's wander into that and have a look. Um, yet dancers now are struggling with video and computer programs in terms of that those that recording so that's shifting what I haven't mentioned is language I realized just an, of that list um, that with the language I was saying that there seems to be a strong idea at the moment of a moving architecture particularly here at the AA some of the work that's that's uh, the architecture that's appearing is connecting across um, basically surfaces that are moving and the interrelationship of the body and the space because the key moment between the architect and the choreographer for me has been where those two meet where the where the the space that the architects creating crosses with the body and the movement of the body created by the choreographer and it, this is where perhaps tonight the wandering can sort of cross over although I suspect we're dominated by architects here there are there's um there are quite a few choreographers Caroline says so um, so that language that I'm interested in of this moving architecture um, was sort of summed up in a th three weeks ago here at the AA when um, a lecture by Jeff Kipnis dancing architecture um, just seemed to hold the whole thing together in terms of where is architecture where could an architecture be of a, of moving that that's moving. Um, so I think in terms of position that's that's where a language can be defined because the wandering into this dance or movement areas is is sort of um, an anti-movement the it's wandering into the superficial and into surface because dance when it's sort of concerned uh, in philosophy is is sort of seen as a bit of a joke. It's a, Nietzsche ridicules it. He doesn't regard it as a um, as a serious topic for discussion. While Hegel, um, when he when he's discussing aesthetics, ignores dance, ignores music, sees architecture as the mother of the ar mother of the arts. Yet, to me, I find that in my work, it's very much about uh, a generator from that from movement, from dance, and from the body. So this this feeling that dance is superficial and is sort of irrelevant to me, the reverse is tr is true. And perhaps one of the texts that's been most useful um, recently has been um, Elizabeth Gross's Volatile Bodies, where she writes about the it really divides the book into two halves in Volatile Bodies. The the first half is the inside out, which is really a sort of phenomenological viewpoint. This experience that the body gets of space. And then she switches to the outside in, in the second half of the book. And there, where you might be thinking it's coming from, well, in a way, it is coming from the uh, the, the architecture because it's she concentrates particularly on Deleuze and Guattari. And I just want to take one quote from them, which I feel is a sort of powerful piece. Uh, we need the video on, I think, as well, actually, but the uh, first video. The quote is, For sublime deeds, like the foundation of a city, or the fabri fabrication of a golem, one draws in the ground, or walks as in a children's dance, combining rhythmic vowels and consonants that correspond to the interior forces of creation, as to the differentiated parts of an organism. Now, f now for me, the, this what we're starting to show here on the video is um, the work that took place as a sort of collaboration between Caroline and myself through um, at Princeton and Columbia Universities in an investigation um, of 
particularly of surface and depth. Now, the, the two things, surface and depth, are, are in a way are sum up the superficial nature of dance or the appearance of dance. And yet, through things like volatile bodies, you can wander deep into the body. And wh what we hope to do in one or two of examples of the work um, to reveal that, that surface and the depth. So I'll try. So we'll keep exchanging and commenting, hopefully between us, harmoniously. That's we'll try. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, put in context what, where I'm going to focus the, co um, the discussion of dance and architecture. I want to shift it slightly towards choreography and architecture, which I keep trying to say a lot of the time because I feel that if we uh, say dance, we should be saying building. And so my, my particular viewpoint on this and how I'm working with Ed is a maker of movement or a creator of space through movement. Okay, so the, the moving and making movement and creating spaces constantly. Dance, you may think of rhythms. You may, can you cut the video there? Uh, you may think of obviously use of body parts and the body as design. Rhythm is actually visual in dance. Okay, so you don't think, so we can cut the oral kind of element. So to shift to looking, and what I'd like to, again, the view on our work to show is um, a look at a process of making. So a process of making that we share. So we share a common language, and it's very obvious to us that we do, and I'm sure some people here, it'll be obvious, but I think to a certain extent it's worth going over those elements that are common. Um, so you're creating constantly changing spaces as you move. And we'll have the second video here. This is purposely a low-key a low video. This is actually a piece that I did um, not with Ed a long time ago, and it's got um, Lindsay Butcher in, and I thought it'd be a nice connection to momentary fusions work. She's in red. Um, <laughs> so this is before she took off and, and started hanging from her legs. So she, she wasn't doing that sort of thing then. And this simple, simple, simple thing, I just want us to, to absorb in that by this movement, the dancers are opening space in front and they're also making connection to space behind. When we make, when I make movement, where, in a sense, is it is it coming from? And I'm, and we work in in kind of three strands. We often talk about an intimate space, a communicative space, and an extrovert space. And this kind of hangs somewhere between the two. Most movement has combines those things, but in terms of creating and people, and also training people and rehearsing, I think they're good ways of working. Um, so intimate space is very much starting from the interior of the body. So you're looking at the interiority of the body, you're experiencing it in breath. If you all breathe in, you have an interior sensation of your body and there's a, an awareness of the body that can start from the interior. And if you only just move a little way from that interior, the movement that you make is intimate. If you start thrusting out slightly more using focus, you get into communicating more with your surrounding. So then you're getting a dialogue between either the architecture, objects, other people. So there's a, there's a dialogue in the space there. And then an extrovert space comes when you throw energy out, when you throw direction. And you're throwing planes to go back to that as I'm making, as, as other people, choreographers, if you think of the different styles of work you see, they're all opening and closing space. Ed's taken over. No, it's just to continue this, that it's actually the reverse process where architects just aren't aware of how a dancer is able to control their inner space and define space. Architects seem to think we have this feeling that we know space, yet suddenly w when um, I think Caroline had a foot on the fridge yesterday and asked, how do you understand that piece of space? It wasn't on, it was a long way away from it. I was just saying that you, ha you read space with your body, 
I'm sure other people who are hero dancers feel that. I, I know what there is over there because I'm reading it with my body. And we just have a heightened sensitivity to space, which I think Julia will come back to later as a way of, of um, working and training. If we can now go on to a few things that came up in the process of making that we realize we keep using together and it's become a sort of a language or a series of concerns and so here's another list for you if you want it but throughout each piece is concerned with different themes different things different spaces but we very much continually playing with spectrums and degrees of the following balance fall and flight openness and closed open and closed, dark and light, intimate, extrovert, interactive, and the size of movement. And those are the things that we've found that we have a common language about. Yeah, shifting planes, opening up space, closing up space. It's, it's, it's all commonality. And what we're going to present very quickly is a range of work for performance pieces that we collaborated and some architecture more that we've collaborated on. And again, there's a complete link. That, so. And the, the idea of this is actually it's slightly improvised and, and it is a collaboration, even this process. I think I'm supposed to explain the dance and Caroline's supposed to explain the architecture, so we cross over between it. This, this piece is very much about patterning and a sort of notation that um, it's called the right to play and it's, a, it's actually um, a city analysis through grids and a labyrinth and then an inner space of of a labyrinth. I can go faster and we're running out of time, so I'm going to zoom through these. Okay, right to play dealt with, we started off with a grid, then there was a labyrinth, then there was chaos, sort of a playful element, and then there was circles. So very much collaboration came from surface, came from pathways, came from the kind of ground mapping, and then what came out of that with the movement. For me, the mo and also there was this, this wall that transformed. Okay, so that was that that piece. Should we go on to another one? Um, this was across time which kind of was influenced by looking at patterning through time and also we used, this was actually, although performed professionally, it was a community um, performers and we had people of different ages that kind of cover that. This was an example of a piece that Ed and I um, planned together. There were 20 copper sheets and so the arrangement of that was just planned together. Okay, so we go on to the next one. Okay, this is going back to Princeton and the collaboration that we did in New York for a year, which was funded by Fulbright. And we look, this was the structure that you saw. No, you haven't seen it yet. Yes, yes, yes you have seen it. And it's also on the image. Uh, this is the interior of the, the structure. I got very much more interested in body work, which some people may understand, release work when I was in New York, and focusing on the inside of the body and the structures. And this kind of probably influenced Ed, or we certainly discussed. And then there were whole other issues which to do with border and viewing and, and stuff like that. There are view holes within it. It was dealing with holding the body, body releasing the body, forming a floor for the body. And, and we did various performance presentations and then uh, this is a sketch by Ed, which he could describe. I think it's pretty obvious. There's a kind of a hell body there. And let's we'll go on now. And kind of mapping. This was the surface of the structure, which then was added, which um, is um, Ed will talk about briefly, will you? Or not? Yeah, I'll try and do it very briefly, which is trying to inter interpenetrate the scale of the body in terms of viewing and, and vistas. And also at that time, the, it was actually under the influence of Raoul Bunchoten used to be here in terms of the skin of the earth and a mapping process, um, riveting and sort of processing through different aspects of the, wor of the world, uh, sort of big experience in New York. This is where it was actually performed on a site at Castle Clinton where the thing is flipped and turned, becomes a floor, becomes a wall. And the Statue of Liberty is out there if people have gone as tourists, so it was all Ah, this is another piece. <laughs> this is a piece that um, was done in 1992 and was our last kind of major dance piece, which was done for the Ballet of Saragossa, which was a very strange shift for me to go from New York to a ballet company in Spain. But I think we managed to kind of do something for them anyway. And Ed got this amazing experience of, of the people who make those kind of um, things that go through the town. They make the set, and so it was very large scale and quite complex in form. There's, um, it's called Vistas de Visivas, 
and the structures have a skin again dealing with skin but it was created but through photocopy and applied kind of image and cultural image and the others were very strong and hard and the strength and the hardness and the form I think came from a lot Zaragoza is a very hard the, the, the north of Spain is a very hard region and there's all also the connections between the three cultures that did exist and that's you know everyone knows the history of Spain and we were influenced by that have we got any more video? Do you want to show the one video? Of yeah, we'll just put a bit of the video of that on. Um, so it has been skimming through. I think we'll come back to a discussion. And I know there are some choreographers in the audience, so hopefully it will has opened up some ideas. Um, this piece, there were three characters that had very little to do with the structures. There was a domesticity in terms of the structures created, but also quite a monumental element, and we played with combining that. Um, the three performers ha represented <coughs> or were called the mother, the muse, and the mad woman. They kind of related to the three cultures, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian, in a kind of vague way. It kind of was influenced. And the three languages, if we get a, a, a chance to look at, the physical languages are completely different from the three, for the three characters. And again, the way that I work has been influenced by collaborating with Ed. And I, I do think spatially sometimes, in terms of floor patterns to feed in, I feel um, that then often leads to the vocabulary. So there are different ways of working through that. And we could just fast forward it and kind of skim it through just to get a flavor of the piece. <laughs> there you go. And the elements that... The thing I was going to say briefly was that um, I was interested in kind of fall and stuff like that in terms of, of metaphor. And as probably people realize, ballet companies do find that hard. But it was something that we kind of pushed them towards. And a kind of connection to these structures was very unfamiliar. So it took them into a, 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 a place that they hadn't been to. I probably won't go again, but anyway. Yeah, Can we switch <laughs> into the slide again? I'll pass it on to Ed, but we should be stopping soon. Okay. Just very quickly into the sort of, to summarize these next series of slides, it's mainly about passage and um, a playing of the movement of, of space. This is um, these are actually little projects. One's for a surgery about the passage of time. It's on an ancient monument, so it's uh, looking at the layering and the people's movement and crossing them over, crossing the two together. That's um, I'm missing there. I think. Yeah. To switch into another project, just in terms of passage and surface being the predominant concerns that when we've played, when we've been moving into architectural projects that we've carried through. Um, this uh, this is a competition for a theatre again in Hereff in uh, the other the other project was in Hereford. The the layer this in terms of layering into the, what was an old swimming pool in the deep end. So the body passes through what was an old swimming pool, um, and the surfaces dictate that movement. Um, and in, in the interior parts of it as well, in terms of that that movement, um, and you actually. That this is too complex to get into in the time we've got. Just a, a completely other thing, working with students in terms of um, this. In, I think the Terminator Two, in terms of a body moving out of a space, um, which we transferred into the Museum of Moving Image um, competition. In terms of an expanding space, a structure that could expand itself and then retract again. Um, again, taking those ideas to be explored with students in. Um, in a more reverie form, so that you you just explore that and draw into it. Um, and finally, a um, a piece, in fact, about Birmingham, um, a skin of Birmingham, where the two where students were taken to a performance, but before that they'd already made a piece, an artifact, to respond to the city. Yeah. Um, this actually is um, an introduction to the next speaker and the next set of issues that are going to be um, produced. Although this for me is um, in a way with the first piece that you saw start in terms of rites and rituals, um, in terms of here the perambulation around the sacred tree in Bombay. 
that then follows into a mass form of movement um, into the festival in um, in Bombay of um, Ganesh, where on the fifteenth day um, thousands of people take their um, their little images of Ganesh and which are made of clay to be submerged into the into the water, um, and that has been in terms of understanding a city and uh, um, as a piece of research that sort of underlies some of this work. And that hopefully is a link into um, Claire Mel Hewish, the next speaker, um, who as a writer has written particularly on anthropology and, um, and mainly for architectural magazines. Claire, can I? It is a link in. Um, I don't come from a dance background, um, but I've always had a great interest in and love of dance. And um, as a writer on architecture, I've been interested in exploring the parallels, which to me seem quite obvious, um, but maybe to choreographers and people involved in dance, I don't know, maybe the sort of links with architecture um, are much more obscure. There seems to be generally much more sort of um, kind of um, sort of ignorance or lack of interest on the part of m people who aren't involved in architecture in architecture. So I don't know whether all these ideas seem kind of very strange, maybe. Um, but it seemed that um, for me as a writer that um, the parallels could be the basis for a constructive critique of architecture, which could get away from the conventional um, commentary on architecture, which is based very much on stylistic analysis. Um, so I'm not going to show any projects or talk about any sort of specific examples, really. I just want to frame the particular ideas that I've been exploring recently, and particularly this sort of overlap with anthropology. Um, I believe that the practice of architecture and the general public understanding of architecture has been really undermined by an obsessive emphasis on its visual dimension. And um, although in, in a way this sort of whole idea of exploring dance and architecture could seem <coughs> suddenly, oh, it's the next kind of fashion. Last year it was art and architecture. This year it's dance and architecture. Next year, you know, it's film and architecture or something. But um, I do think that dance, because it involves movement, has more perhaps to say to architecture than almost any other of these art forms. Um, the agencies which commission and determine through regulations the construction of the built environment are led entirely by visual aesthetic criteria um, and show a blind ignorance to the meaning of spatial experience. And you find this in the most sort of banal situations. A small example um, is Westminster Planning Authority in its official guide to roof design where it states that an open roof terrace should be screened by a fake dormer window to give the appearance of a traditional mansard roof. Um, such absurd strictures uh, are not just laughable, but they seriously scramble our understanding of space and architectural form um, as it is founded in physical experience, our body image, and our memory they actually distort the relationship between a person's inner mental and bodily space and the external physical world, which is mediated by our particular cultural framework wherever we are in the world and at whatever time. And it ends up um, in a real sense of disorientation and confusion. One of the most succinct and illuminating discussions of architecture as a physical experience, I think, is found in quite an old book now, Body, Memory and Architecture by Bloomer and Moore. They sum it up quite well, stating possession of a house like a body 
is a feeling that calls on all senses, but is the direct consequence of feelings that are confirmed haptically, in contrast to the more distant and figurative, figurative feelings that are experienced visually and audially. However, the word haptic, which means a process of physical exploration through movement, is one which is very rarely used in the contemporary debate about architecture. And I'd like to sort of bring it back and to suggest that an identification of haptic experience with choreography, um, as Caroline has discussed, should be central to this forum today. We can bring it into focus by moving away from the traditional art history-based critique of architecture, which stresses aesthetic visual criteria, and embracing and developing an anthropological perspective, expounding architecture as the physical and spatial embodiment of cultural value systems and social structures which are enacted through everyday activities. In his book, Non-Places, the Anthropology of Supermodernity, um, a quite recently published, a couple of years ago, the Fren French anthropologist Marc Auger proposes a distinction between what he calls non-places, such as motorways, airport lounges, and supermarkets, and places of identity. In the former, physical experience is mediated or substituted by signs comprising words and images, leading to a dematerialization of space, while the latter are invested with meaning through reiterated actions or rituals, that is, the actions and movements of the body in relation to its surrounding space, or put another way, the choreography of the dance of everyday life. It's interesting that Ed brought up that example of Bombay because a lot of this stuff seems to have been um, discussed in India for some reason. Um, and at a seminar on the subject of architectural anthropology held in India some years ago in Bombay, the scholar Jan Piper undertook a, an interesting analysis of the spatial structure and architectural landmarks of a South Indian temple city in terms of haptic experience and body image. The result was a map of the city based on a network of movements, and here I suppose is another list, towards, around, away from, and beside, and corresponding to our postural sense of low, high, right, left, symmetrical, asymmetrical, axial, diagonal, before, behind, and beneath. The top topography which this generated was ceremonially activated on the occasion of large urban festivals through processions and rituals, which Piper defines as the collective staging of possible individual experiences of space. Piper's choice of terms, I would say, explicitly draws us into the language of choreography and dance. And this is a language which is equally apl applicable to contemporary architecture and urbanism in different cultures, in Western culture as well as in um, Eastern cultures. And this is something which I try to explore and to demonstrate in an issue of the magazine Architectural Design on architecture and anthropology, which I put together and was published in 1996. Um, and in that, I've included, as well as a series of articles by architectural writers and anthropologists, a, quite a wide variety of buildings and urban spaces where this whole language um, really comes through. Perhaps then it's appropriate to conclude by quoting the choreographer, Martha Graham. She says, all of life today is concerned with space problems even political life. Space language is a language we understand, which I would propose is a perfect mantra for the practice of architecture today. Thank you very much, Claire. I'm going to lead straight into Juliet. Juliet Milner was a student here with 
Pascal Schoenig um, and has worked during her time as a <coughs> student with Bunty Mathias, has, I think, continued, done one project since, and she's going to discuss other collaborations. I'm done. I'm going to talk about an urban playground of fairy tale and fantasy, of myth and chalk circles. My basic premise is that the way we encounter architecture is primarily through movement, through the sensual experience of moving through spaces. The way we construct spaces is through responding to changing and emerging demands. People tend to grow fatter or thinner, redder or greener, move in, move out and move on. We live in cities that constantly rethink themselves through economic cycles, migration, globalization, earthquake, and war. This is the very real terrain of architecture. It is a terrain of movements. The words choreography and choreography are very similar. Choreography is defined as describing or delineating regions and districts on a map. Choreography is defined as the art of notation of movement. In Peter Brook's The Empty Space, he writes, we identify emotionally, subjectively, and at the same time we evaluate politically, objectively, in relation to society, because deep roots are sunk beyond the everyday, and a ritualistic use of rhythm shows us those aspects of life which are not visible on the surface. A choreographer can elicit emotion or tell a story through a series of movements to make an idea visible. Bunty Matthias went a step further. Her emotions appear visible in lines of movement through sheets of fabric. The fabric is rubber. To me, the image of the bodies in sheets of rubber were an expression of invisible lines of human conflict. The power of this image is twofold. One, the dynamic qualities of the rubber, transforming from solid planes of vibrant color to almost liquid states. And two, the, rub the body unfolding spatial configurations through the rubber. I worked on a number of projects with Bunty, constructing temporary spaces for events. At the Design Museum on the South Bank, I wanted the space to visually echo the choreography operating on different scales. I obtained sponsorship from Iridion to light the area in chameleonic colors. The idea was to direct people toward the area and draw them into the space through the movement of light. Close to the time of the dance, we blasted light from outside into the stairwell to draw people up. The suspended sculptures forming the performance space were derived from my drawings of the spatial configurations of rubber. to appear chrysalis-like, the shell of movement or shell of a previous existence. The performance was lit with a piece of video projection I constructed from moving x-rays, editing with music to create visual rhythms of light. Another project involving moving light was with fashion designer Hussein Shalayan. Hussein says, fashion is about becoming something you're not. He invents a storyline, then designs clothes for the characters. He was interested in the way fairy tales shape female, female role and fantasy. We played with two characters, one of Rapunzel and the other of a drowning witch. His collections often use erotic ornaments of death or of transition. Rapunzel was rewritten into a version where her hair became the strings to a dress which turned into a kite so she could float out of her prison tower. I wanted to evoke some of the ideas in the space. I suggested that when you walk into the show, you feel the presence of a floating body above, unsure if it is alive or dead. I made an improvised piece of film underwater filming with a list of words, restraint, release, trapped, drifting, drowning, waves, words that Hussein and I had talked about. This piece of film was then projected on the ceiling at the start of the show to evoke a feeling in the space of the forthcoming collection. 
I'm currently working with sculptor Helena Blumenfeld. Her work is characterized by broken surfaces and layering. Through myth and illusion, a single piece of marble can express a range of human emotion. For example, in Venus, one side is a female warrior striding out. The other, she is seductive, yielding, fragile. I make scale drawings from Helena's paper models and sketches, which form part of the process of making the sculpture. and show how a series of sculptures relate to each other and their specific spaces. I will conclude with a city scale project. I worked for Beaver Mull Architects on the Bonn Architecture Forum. The problem Bonn faces is the moving house of the government. Robert wanted to register in images the scale of evacuation, equivalent to that caused by major natural disaster. Katrina wanted to express the sense of loss the emotional effect on the city as mourning with tears and welts across the city. I was, in, I was interested in the spatial conflicts of relocating the government from Bonn to Berlin. I introduced Brecht's chalk circle plays as a narrative analogy for the conditions looming over Bonn. Brecht took an ancient Chinese story in which two women, one the natural mother, the other the foster mother, both claim the same child. A rascally judge, Azdak, draws a chalk circle in a public space. The child stands within the circle, and both women are instructed to pull the child out, to decide who the child belongs to. The outcome is different in each of the two versions of the play, inferring that it is not the solution, but the method of resolution, drawing of the chalk circle, that matters. Katrina fabricated a kinetic sculpture derived from images of the site. We read this kinetic sculpture of balance as a spatial representation of Azdak, the judge, drawing his chalk circle. This is our physical model, or choreographic instrument. Our Azdak structure is seen to hover over Bonn and actively play within its chalk circle. Arcs, sways, welts, and tears mark out and connect the new emptiness. The myth of the chalk circle rewrites and redraws where spirit but not substance has been erased. The choreographic instrument is a tool for dreaming, a planning device. The instrument is given to the city of Bonn as an enduring reminder that the normative is not enough and that the dream must be sustained. In summary, in the first project, we created visual rhythms of light through choreography. In the second, the actions of Rapunzel's story unfolded in evocative space. In the third, a static object expressed a sense of movement. In the fourth, we invented a choreographic instrument for planning. I will finish with a quote from Bernard Chumi. Architecture is as much about the events that take place in spaces as about the spaces themselves. The static notions of form and function, long favored by architectural discourse, need to be replaced by attention to the actions that occur inside and around buildings, to the movement of bodies, to activities, to aspirations, to promiscuous collisions, in which the terms intermingle, combine, and implicate one another in the production of a new architectural reality. Thank you so much. The next poem, I'm not quite sure what the connection is to be, but certainly language, the, the common language of dynamic fluid with the dancer and the architect. Um, Tom um, teaches in grad design here and is a member of Ocean, so Tom Clark. Thank you. Thanks for also apologizing that I don't have much to do with dance. Um, I think I appreciate dance and find movement a great source of inspiration. Maybe dancing, although that might be a predictable uh, sort of discussion. Um, maybe what makes movement um, in a sort of contemporary scene on a digital level is what I'd like to sort of raise. Um, there might be an image which I would have loved to have made a slide of, of some events that are occurring at the ICA that are quite interesting, just in terms of, they blur a kind of inclusion of people, similar to this event, um, whereas we could easily imagine this in an architecture school, yet there's not one architect included in this event at the ICA. Um, but a lot of people involved in the uh, digital music industry. So that's, that's actually uh, sort of supports a half-baked argument. Um, 
it's perhaps the techniques that produce um, both a kind of, we'll put this away, um, that, put, that produce a kind of digital space, uh, whether it's a musical space or that of an architectural space, that has to do with um, the effects of uh, an agglomeration or collection or proliferation of flows and fluxes, um, of variable intensities, gradation. Um, movement certainly has been an issue throughout, and I, perhaps maybe that's why I've I'm, I'm, uh, been invited to, to speak here. Um, what might interest to me more, or the work that I might show in a couple of minutes, is not so much the movement of the body or of people within the space, but the space itself, so the spatiality, uh, and uh, perhaps the discussion that it's not the visuality of, of the movement, but the spatiality, um, that the physically that the space is uh, in motion, and whether that's generated by uh, flows that have, you know, I think the flow of the light, how it might change in this room, or the air, or even the sound may be more interesting, the communication, uh, flow of information, the activational uh, difference of flow, which is to some extent bodily, but I think is also uh, perceptive. Um, in terms of the techniques, um, it's the transformations of whether it's a sound bite or a visual bite uh, that turns into a kind of um, space. Um, but the mode of production uh, is certainly connected to the experience of the effects um, within a musical or architectural space. And perhaps just the equivalence in such a short time, just to sort of catalog perhaps three techniques uh, and this equivalence between uh, the production of digital music. And I don't want to say a digital space. We might sort of fall into a discussion of uh, the virtual, which I, I, uh, I think it's perhaps the relevance is the production of architecture through digital manipulation of uh, form, um, perhaps. Um, sampling is one technique uh, as a mode of integrating difference via cataloging, um, which is very different from collage, but it includes uh, perhaps just about anything um, as a sample. Uh, and the effect is a shared culture. Um, several years ago in a, um, well, quite a, it's perhaps a pertinent court case in America, um, James Brown's lawyers took public enemy to court. And um, a famous quote that I love is Chuck D said, you can't steal a beat. And I wonder what the spatial equivalent within architecture is. You know, can you actually steal a, a space, you know, it, uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and the verdict was, yes, you cannot steal a beat, so sampling became a kind of credible mode of production, uh, perhaps within architecture as well. Um, the way a, a sample is brought in is through a loop. Um, the loop is a mode of repeating in a kind of musical repetition as a bar, uh, giving it a rhythm, um, and through iteration. It's, these are terms that I think within schools of architecture were, were um, quite familiar with. Um, within that, perhaps the, the technique of grafting uh, as, a, as uh, producing the effect of allowing a kind of, uh, to use a musical term, a symphonic effect of allowing a, a kind of spreading of an ambience of a, of a sound um, and within a space uh, um, if one covers this space with a movement of flowers all over the space, that's a graft of flowers while still allowing everything else to occur. Um, so the emergence of these, digi uh, of these digital techniques um, may allow an alterability of the production of space uh, and its ex uh, sort of experience, but more importantly, the adaptability or the flexibility of that result in space. Uh, there are some terms with, by which we could possibly describe the spatiality rather than the visuality, which um, I think um, which Claire raised as a um, perhaps this hopt haptic um, versus an optic. Um, if we can maybe have the slides, Joel, please. Yeah. Um, if one remembers this image, I, I, I'll sort of hold it up. Um, I don't really want to talk about what the projects are. They're, they're all from Ocean UK and pre-Ocean UK, one of them, um, as, as projects. But I, I don't necessarily want to talk about what the projects are. Perhaps just uh, describing them within terms of um, 
of movement. This may describe a, a form which iterates through a, a, a sort of gradation of intensity um, over to in time, I mean, some, of the, some of the sort of terms that have come up. Um, but the continuous flux um, as a flow ac across the geography is uh, what may describe um, this, this project or that image. Um, the next ser series of slides are from a, from a project which um, could be called the Flux of Light. Um, I'd really defer from even describing what, these, what, what this is uh, as a representation, um, but its, it's effect of projection of light underneath the surface as continuously um, alterability of a, of a localized difference that every in, infinite, infinitesimal geography would be um, the effect as a gradation um, in constant transformation across uh, a kind of surface geography. Uh, perhaps several systems um, on a tectonic um, level which should be described. Uh, the previous slide described the, the geography at to the sort of bottom of the slide. Um, the other systems, uh, the one that has all these lines, uh, would be moving with it with the wind, as a sort of, as a, the project describes, as fiber optic light cables which would be flowing with the movement of air. Um, so I think there's, there's perhaps that bodily difference. Um, then some of the other, uh, the bands that follow the existing geography, uh, which uh, are deformed and deflected to the existing ground. So they, they, the effect is a, is a secondary or elevated ground which um, models itself directly from the existing landscape then an entirely artificial set of slabs interweaves uh, to those um, topographical bands and the vertical lines would be um, these fiber optic cables in, a, in the vertical state. Um, so one can imagine the, the movement of the spatial experience being, re being read through an infinite um, amount of, um, infinite amount, well, an infinite change of uh, position would give just as much of a difference in spatial experience in that the movement in time is what is the issue perhaps. This, this slide may reveal more clearly the, uh, the topographical change uh, as a kind of flux um, of the flow of the um, physical topography. Um, I'd like to show a series of images which uh, cut through uh, a competition proposal that has a, um, a title. Uh, I don't really want to talk about where these projects are, what they are, uh, but it's called Loop Logic. So this is a very straight elevation, um, uh, extremely severe as a, as a street frontage of an elevation. Um, and as, as one enters, um, one moves into uh, a sectional space which is continuously altering itself through the, the kind of oblique uh, geo geographical movement of two loops that intertwine. And this, both the sectional diagram and a plan diagram is a sort of infinity loop. Uh, and it starts to have um, cross connections and loopings across. Uh, this may start to become clear as the plan diagram emerges and rise up. So as a, um, well, an object, one might say, as a you know, really a building, um, within an interior, the, the flows uh, that are caused from this looping uh, describe a, a potential set of spatial experiences that are continuously altered or, or adaptive and altered of um, a static fixed experience. Um, perhaps on a, on a more extreme level, um, three, three tectonic systems uh, of this project which 
we just call it drifts, increments, and transitions, uh, the three systems are probably quite clear as to what their, what their flows would be of, of the difference of flow, the characteristic difference. Um, and I wouldn't like to describe much more because I think it's quite evident what the, um, what the spatial uh, difference in terms of the, the technique, the three techniques that are described. Maybe I'll just point them out to those that are less familiar with um, the production of architectural space and that of dance space. Um, the, f the roughly horizontal uh, layering of this um, uh, of, of the incremental shifting of, of, a, of a planar geography. Uh, the second one would be this um, the transitions of uh, the kind of sectional wrapping, and the third would be these drifts in in the long uh, long direction. Perhaps. Um, I enjoyed the terms by which uh, uh, um, Claire was talking about um, sort of relative movement or positioning of towards, around, away from, before, behind, beneath. Uh, this is, uh, these are four diagrams of, uh, of a pre-ocean project, Yokohama uh, 94. Um, and the project was called um, Over Under Through. And the next may describe the kind of sectional um, possibility of the naming of a project in those terms. It also had a, another title of a working title called Shades of Whiteness. But I, th I think in the context of this talk, over under through may be um, more pertinent. Um, another project which uh, has a title Liquid Landscapes, uh, which I perhaps I'm showing just two images of, um, of building pro housing prototypes as how the section may go through an incremental transformation uh, and an, a kind of sectional um, alterity as it rises up uh, through entirely conventional constructional techniques. Um, and this is the, the kind of sample of, uh, of stair changes as each beat or each bar uh, or each loop, um, that sort of musicality, and I, I don't want to actually get into that. This is frozen music or anything, um, and that's that before that question comes up. Um, and one last um, view of uh, another el uh, another uh, cut as an elevational uh, view of the same prototype, uh, and how the incremental change uh, and the fluxes and flows cause a kind of heightened visuality, but um, with the intention of um, causing a fluid spatiality. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, John, can you quickly change over and be ready with the video? We're going to move quite quickly. running out of time, I'm going to very quickly show you some of the things that I do with students here. My interest in the dance and architecture is twofold, and the first one will be very much to do with how I've been involved, not just with Gabby Agus, but she's got to be the, the main concern, that I'm, the main person that I bring up here. Um, I was brought in to teach spatial awareness. It sounds terrible, but that, I actually did have a kind of job title when I started here. And you think, well, I, I've got that naturally. How the hell am I going to get people to, to learn it sort of within months? So <laughs> anyway, one way was to get involved, get dancers involved in the school. Um, I think I actually want the video first. This is, this is, well, should be, Ga yeah, Gabby working with a student that's in the room now. <laughs> uh, the project is Threshold. It's basically a mapping project that leads to a performance that the students themselves produce. Gabby was used in this case um, to explore one of the sites chosen. 
So Gabby should not be describing it, but helping the student. And they've had a discussion, and Gabby is helping the student to understand the space. This. <laughs> Threshold is obviously one theme which, or state of events which students new to architecture have to encounter. What Gabby does is in one day, sometimes two, work with 15 students rushing from all the different sites and working very quickly with their instructions help them. In a previous year it was more to do with the Ashtats um, in slide. Um, she was at a later stage in the project. So this might look quite simple, but perhaps if we can get the students to mention anything later, they'll tell you how helpful it was. He just happens to be there. <laughs> okay, that, that's it, Joel, on that one. And the, the next video. Both um, Ed, Caroline teach, uh, Tom teaches, but what hasn't really come up is does um, the experience of space, does sending students out to explore it themselves, working with dancers, does that help them? to develop their design skills. We need the sound on this one very much. <laughs> This, this piece is a, a result of working for about a month on the threshold project. Emu and Liz did three performances, this is one of them. The first one involved projection of the two sites that they'd worked with. Um, this is hopefully quite obvious that they're relating to their own bodies and shadows and light. Keyword threshold. They did about eight workshops with Gabby. The workshops which we run, uh, a student got them involved, um, started up again. They're running at Friday lunch times here in the school, where it's very basic. Um, it's the training that I would imagine most contemporary dancers are having themselves. Starting very much with standing still, understanding that your feet hold you to the ground. Sometimes, other times you have to become, as I hope, momentary fusion will remind us of being anti-gravity. Um, a lot of time spent on the floor. But you have to understand, these are new students to the school. They've never, ever been asked to do anything like this in public. And, well, this, this piece... <laughs> I did want some fun to come back into tonight. <laughs> um, because I do think that the... If we're going to force students to become spatially aware, then it has to be fun. <laughs> Um, otherwise you're insulting their own um, ability to understand space. And I think we've learned through quite a few of the speakers tonight that we do have it in language. We have a common field there. 
but usually to um, expose and use the body, particularly the moving body, is mainly an embarrassment to um, non-dancers. And then we'll go straight into the slides. Um, so this was imprinted time a, uh, a previous year using Gabby. Um, different sites, slightly different project. This is as much to do with sound and texture and surface as it was to do with the kind of space that the student had chosen to. In this instance, the students had to map, um, they had to do plan and sections of um, a part of their journey. I'm next going to show just a, a random selection, although it won't look random to some people, <laughs> um, of design images from a couple of units in the school, quite hurriedly put together in the slide library just now. Um, because I, although I want very much that we come back to dance, and I think obviously through various speakers, dance has got perhaps put to one side, and I'm hoping that through what you've just seen, it, it is at the forefront, certainly, of my teaching. Um, but the next slides are going to be of people's work who perhaps haven't, but are using, haven't certainly danced um, for their education, but are using, as Tom does, the language of dance, movement, fluid, flux, dynamic. So I'm going to ru rush through them. They might be in the audience, the people that have done this. <laughs> Not, no, no, that person won't be in the audience. Okay. <laughs> um, and this Lieberskin. Um, it's, it's another Daniel Lieberskin. I think the, the, the model here, the, the, the covering, the, we, we were intending to mention, I think, Ed and I, a bit more on notation and score, teaching of score drawing. Um, that's certainly a connection between the architect and the dancer. Um, it's a Zaha, Zaha Hadid. It's the, um, the peak Hong Kong. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there, and I think the, what, just to bring up a few things so that we can get on with a discussion because there are certain things I know that we haven't talked about that I, I wish had come up but throwing together some people on the dance and architecture crossover um, there's actually just too much in common but I'm hoping that certain things might come up this is moving back I think into architectural theory rather than dance but Hopefully, the dancers or choreographers here have read or do know of Eisenman and Virilio and John Rackman. In last year, there was a conference called The Anybody. There have been articles linking things like plastic surgery, the synthetic body, sex on the internet, to new urban design. Um, Vidler mentions the loss of Cartesian perspective. Gary forces the body to experience space away from our preconception of how the body and space should work, or rather our preconception of how it works. And dancers are questioning movement all the time, coming up with strategies. So are architects. We have this mutability, instability, flux. So I'm opening up to the floor now on that level. We have a moving microphone, or we could have more. <laughs> I hope I've 
I hope to plant a few. Can I, can I remove that one? Well, it might be. Is it on? Is it on? No, it's not. Okay. Can I move to Ar 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 Are you willing to go first? <laughs> All right. Well, it's just because what one subject is is um, the structure, which I think. I mean, if we go if we go back to our panel, um, that the moving body forms form a structure, and I know that that's something that we've discussed on a couple of occasions. A little anecdote on that one. If can I take it? Mm. Uh, this one. That. Um, was one of my students was um, wandering into Columbia University's internet site and managed to find a lecture of um, Bernard Schumann's. And there, uh, a note about a video game called Super Mario, um, and almost an understanding of space through the use of 3D Super Mario, in that there's a 2D version of this um, video game which is um, plotted by plan. So you move. Um, you move as in a person has just moved along a plan. But then in the 3D version, the space moves around the person. So it has to be done in a completely different way. And that's what he was sort of saying, is a different perception of space going on through um, s using the video game. Um, and also that also links into, I mean, this is sort of a t one of the themes of this is technology, but the, the other um, sort of parallel anecdote was an understanding of space through movement in Berlin where someone commented that the new Berlin felt like it had been done on the computer. Um, it just as you walked along feeling the, uh, the, the buildings on either side, the space in fact had been designed in that way. It had been thought of on a computer screen and through, a, through walkthroughs, um, which w again we wouldn't have had that sort of awareness of. So anyway, there's a little technology kick for some people to maybe respond to. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? No comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from the dance side. Um, something I observed was the, this thing of having straight lines and curved lines. And I felt this sort of evolution from sort of more straight things to this completely sort of fluid world which the, the technology allows for. And I was also thinking about it in terms of the, the female and um, sort of female expression in architecture and so on. Um, and also just the very practical aspects of making curved shapes in architecture physically in the world and how I imagine that's quite difficult to, to create. And I've just started a project with Stefan here and um, I found myself getting involved in trying to create a corridor and sort of ending up creating this curving space which was created through using straight um, falls of cloth um, to create a walk through and um, I just I felt as well somewhere that the technology thing was bringing out this, this sense of the spine it was like this sort of flow of movement and I found it very exciting actually it, it's really inspired me the sort of scene of progression. I don't know if I've particularly got any questions, but it's just an observation, and it's really given me a different sort of, I don't know, look on movement. So thank you. It's, a, it's quite a perceptive uh, observation. Uh, uh, I wouldn't like to think that you know everything is about shifting towards you know, a curvilinear geometry, but if I could maybe ref relate what you've just observed to Julia's comment about Cartesian space. Um, Le Corbusier, uh, you know, architect of the century, for those that really are out of, um, out of the realm of, of the history of architecture, um, called the, the straight line that of the human and the curved line that of the donkey, and that because we're so civilized and intelligent, we, uh, the justification for the straight line is that we're uh, really into a kind of Cartesian world of uh, X, Y, Z planes, um, and that that's why we build that way. And that's why our architectural space and, and, and our appreciation, sensibility, and production, the whole mode of production has evolved to a level that we you know, are without straight lines. Where uh, I think much of what we've seen, and, and really the contemporary scene, questions the civil status of uh, Cartesian space. And maybe someone else can sort of go on to that, but I, I think that's, that's quite a, 
uh, perceptive observation, even though I don't think we're now re-evolving into curvilinear geometries per se. I'm from the dance side as well. Um, the question I have is um, how effective is the static image of dance compared to the actual the movement? It seems that um, there's very much an, an academic justification for um, works of architecture and structure. Um, but how academic can the um, the experiential moment be in dance, which is often to chance. Um, and from the slide, from watching the video versus the slides of frozen mo um, movement, I was wondering which would an architectural student find more useful or effective? Are, are you picking up on the last few images? I've then. Well, yeah. um, in particular, the video. Just now, the yeah. Just now versus, and then and then you had the the, the actual slides of the movement, mm, which mm. would which was static. Well, the one I mean, the one of the reasons why I showed the students performing is because having gone through workshops, dance workshops, and I mean, I tend to call them for, the, for their sake because they're new to the school movement workshops, but they are taught by a choreographer. They do engage within the end of the first. Um, session, what other people would call dance, and I, I think it, it carries them through very quickly to when they then walk through different spaces. Mm. It is traditional, the phenomenological experience, it's, it, it's <laughs> we're not fighting that at that point. I think the, the how relevant that is when we get to um, the design. I think there's more. There's more than just that experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think really you'd have to ask the students. I mean, what what I hope they gain <coughs> is that they don't have to be conscious of whether they're going through narrow spaces, wide spaces, mm -hmm. tall spaces, in, uh, imposing, and all all the other words we can use. It becomes just um, well. I talk about it like the body is a tool. But you don't want them. It's the same as you don't think of your pencil when you're using it. You don't think of the keyboard when you're on the computer. It's it's got to be that through through the design work, um, they're f they're not carrying baggage. It, they're free, and and it's it's. But I'm intending, I'm proposing, it's actually how, how do they feel about it? Because it's being forced on them very quickly. Mm. Mm. together, the dance and architecture can help to think three-dimensional, not design <coughs> patterns on the drawing board, but think of the spaces. <coughs> not, not really. I think it, to become one, to become a simultaneous experience that you, you are designing a particular space that you already feel you're in. You're not seduced by the line. That's, um, does that say anything? <laughs>
think there are the several layers, you, you as a, a dancer and architect. It's in people like that that you actually realize there is a complete synthesis and, and language there that can be shared. And that um, the development, not, not simply feeling space, but making spaces with your body, which I don't know, but I would like to push your students to do. I mean, they were in that last one. They may have felt it was all through experience and threshold, and that's what I'm doing it for. But actually, they'd created a form which was fascinating to look at. And so it's, it's making... I mean, can I just say, you can't prescribe that. You can't tell a student that's what they're going to do, as you can't easily tell a dancer that, that, that what they're learning while they're learning it. I mean, so I'm saying translation happens if you're not fully involved in both camps. <laughs> if you are somehow involved with both, there's no translation happening. Would you agree? I don't know. There's I mean, I think, interestingly, probably Tom's work does show it the most, in a sense, in terms of drawings. Um, but there is the whole thing of, of journeying through, which is, in other words, taking time and space together and seeing that as the movement of the body through the form. There is also through... It is solid. I mean, one thing, when we first started collaborating, the thing I use to this is that dance choreographers want to be more, um, what did I call it? more solid. We want to see our work last longer in space. You know, we do a movement and you say to someone, make it more clear spatially in terms of energy and, and it'll last, you know, that's, that will last. And architects seem to want to be less solid. So there is an antithesis. We can't say that it's not there. Um, and I suppose, slightly cheekily, we call ourselves moving architects just because things inform each other. So um, I'll perhaps I'll pass on to Ed in terms of moving architecture. Elements move, light moves. There are all, all sorts of things that encourage us to think of solid, not solid architecture not being solid. You know, I mean, are we aware of the solidity of this room? Yeah. I mean, in regards to movement in architecture, when you say, I mean, any environment has an influence on the human being, how mm. it behaves and how it moves. Yeah, that's awesome. And the other way the human being can influence the environment. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there's a movement there. And I, I see the movement in architecture in terms of that. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, the body, the moment it moves, it creates space. Mm. So it, it keeps on moving and it's that liquidity of spaces. Mm. Um, and I think uh, experience from how, what is the, I mean, what is, why are you getting an architecture student to do movement for? Because he then becomes aware of how it's not, it's no longer the hand that draws that creates space, but the body, the whole body creates space. Mm -hmm. And now where you place the body, it matters. And I think if you experience physically, different spaces or create spaces with your body, then I think it helps in designing. No, I was just going to throw out that, I mean, we, we could consider um, architecture being like elements of it more moving. <laughs> I mean, but it, you know, the, the I don't know enough about examples. What are there, there must be some buildings which you would consider is a movement experience rather than, I mean, like these, sorry, I love this building, but I mean, it's like solid, isn't it? You come in and you feel, right? <coughs> yeah. You're here. You feel, sorry, you feel upright. <laughs> yeah. But again, that's in terms of the design and the surface. Thank you. 
That's exactly, though, what choreography... D if, if I go like that to someone in the audience and she takes it back to me and we stay for five seconds and then we shift, we've done something and we've shifted. Two things have to happen in time. In architecture, that time, yeah, okay, you've got the audience, the body moving through it, but two planes hitting each other do... There's a similarity in what's happening. It's not the same. No one can say it's the same. But there are angles and juxtapositions which are going to engender more um, interplay, perhaps. You know, I don't know. Throw it out to the floor. Um, as a student, I feel that when I'm um, using dance to explore a site, I am proposing. And architects say that they are proposing when they're designing. So I have to think of my body as a proposal. Uh, and that can be either in what Pascal said, either in time or mm. in form. Yeah, how, do, how do you respond to that, Pascal? <laughs> be a possibility of bridging some, without making any kind of analogy, but of how the flow of um, a kind of organizational uh, movement in this room differs radically from that of putting this table at that end and having parallel rows. Uh, the, the movement of not so much one body, but 100 bodies coming in here and activating a space entirely differs from how it's arranged. Um, and that already becomes an architectural problem <coughs> or an organizational issue. Uh, I don't know if that sort of proposes some sort of um, mode of at least um, understanding that the organizational change uh, just from the, the kind of physical difference of the organization, you know, this kind of hemispheric organization versus a parallel organization of, of chairs. And one can, we can probably think of uh, a multiplicity of other possibilities um, organizationally which would choreograph the architectural activation of this space. So uh, choreograph the movement of the space. Well, the the movement, bodily yeah. movement of the space. Yeah. Yeah. But also the, the, the yeah, I, mean, I, I wouldn't really know if this is, if this is, if we're dancing right now just because It doesn't have to be dance yeah, to call it yeah. choreography, does it's, it? No, it's choreographed, it's a notated yeah. space as a, as a diagram of, of movement. Maybe to answer Pascal's question, that, uh, or comment rather, of a line being that of a boundary, uh, and that in, in dance being more of, uh, of, of a consideration of time. I think also something within architecture which we can draw lines which suggest movement, and then perhaps this, what Caroline and, and Ed, you were both uh, beginning to discuss, of how patterning on a floor, a uh, sort of horizontal surface, begins to suggest and actually affect or cause some effects of movement and in a sense control or influence what the directionalities of how we move and that we might follow a line uh, with uh, or how the activation of the space may be affected. And is that is that sort of the intention or is that just a reading that... Uh, no, um, yeah, it, it's an intention but there are many things that you said there. That's why I don't think the relationship between choreography and architecture is simple, and it's it's single, singular. You've mentioned um, the architect choreographing movement, in effect, what you've just described. So that's one element of it. It's not the only thing that's interesting in in the in the collaboration in in the two fields, but it was one.
energy or the way that energy is um, distributed in that space. Is that something you might use? Why, why don't you pick up on that stand? Because that, that is quite in relationship to what you were talking about. I don't know. I've only used dance as a tool to understand a site. But I think that you can respond to the energy of a place through your own energy, or you can respond to built form with your form. About using dance as a tool to represent the space rather than dance as the space. I mean, is that how movement is, u is used for the students here as a, as a tool rather than in its, in its own right? And that's the point. Where is the point of connection between the two? Is, is, is what I mean, is one used against to represent another? Well, I think Caroline did bring this up. Um, when she showed her video and she was talking about how simple that, that very gentle um, the, the dancers were well, that they were moving across and between each other and saying that they were creating different spaces between each other. I think it, in terms of the education with the students, it's, again, you, you can't prescribe it. You hope that they will realise that they are um, often creating voids. If we talk about space void as opposed to but they are defining space. They're not just using it to experience and therefore carry in their, like within their memory bank. But that is one reason why you teach it. It's that they, they start becoming aware without having to get the measuring tape out how, how a space differs, mm -hmm. that their, their body becomes conscious of how tall a room is, how wide, and that's what presumably you deal with dancers. But it's, it's, it's also that... Um, They have, s at different times, it would be for each of them, being conscious of creating definitions. And I think that picks up on this, the, the drawn line, and I, I, I want Pascal.